Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And John, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm the past chairman of the Department of Ocean Engineering at the University of Hawaii. And I've also at other points in my career uh, been in the political sphere. I was ocean resources manager for the state of Hawaii, advising the governor and trying to uh, build new industries in Hawaii, including ocean mining. I, I've also had the privilege of being a lecturer in the law school at the University of Hawaii on resource issues and uh, go back there every once in a while until I offend them by not being politically correct enough. Because uh, as you might guess, with all kinds of native issues and environmental issues, the University of Hawaii Law School specializes in political correctness. <laughs> in any case, uh, I am going to describe to you uh, mining on the, on the seafloor, and I'm going to give you an example of the folks who did it right, and I'm going to give you an example of all the folks who have done it wrong. So uh, you're, you're, you're going to get to see uh, the two groups of people here. Now, I, I'm going to start with fascination for mineral resources on the seafloor, and I am going to give you this quote. In the ocean depths, there are mines of zinc, iron, silver, and gold that would be quite easy to exploit. And you may ask when and who that comes from. And that comes from Captain Nemo from, <laughs> from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, Jules Verne wrote that in 1870. Uh, manganese nodules were actually discovered on land in 1867 in the Swiss Alps by some climbers who couldn't figure out what they were. So Jules Verne knew about these things. Um, and and they, they sort of caught his fascination. Now, Jules Verne is very interesting because he has the greatest track record in the world of future prediction. So from all of the various things that he's promoted as a science fiction writer 135 years ago, almost 60% of them have come true. And that is a greater track record than any psychic and any other futurist the world has ever seen. This guy was amazingly good. So he said in the bottom of the ocean, there are going to be all these mines that are easy to exploit. So uh, manganese nodules were discovered on the ocean floor in 1872. And, and we have things like this from the 1930s, millions in gold free for the taking from modern mechanics who caught everybody's uh, thought. And in the 1930s, they were like, oh, here we got some equipment there. And this looks really easy to do. And, and you know, a great fascination with all this sort of stuff. And, this sort of carried on, and uh, in the, the 1950s, you know, people started to, to explore this in, in much greater detail. And I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of the resources first so you'll know what we're talking about. And then I'm going to put it in the perspective of some of the law. And I'm going to talk about four different resources. Now, these are not the only thing on the ocean floor. You've got corals and sand and gravel and, and other sorts of things. But I'm going to talk about four different things. The first three are, are so far economic failures. And the fourth one, offshore diamonds, is a, an exquisite success. And, and so, so number four are the guys who did it right. Number one, two, and three are the guys who did it wrong. Okay, so just keep, we're going to come back to that. Okay, so number four, the, good, the, the winners, numbers one, two, and three, the guys who didn't make it. Okay, so we'll talk about these four different types of minerals. So number one, polymetallic sulfides. These are from hydrothermal vents, your black smokers on the sea floor. They're from 1,000 to 2,500 meters, copper, gold, silver, zinc, and a range of other things. You have a company that I will be talking about called Nautilus Minerals, which came very close to mining these things. It was dissolved by the Superior Court of British Columbia about two months ago. Okay, number two are manganese nodules. 
So these are down from 3,500 to 5,000 meters. They're not hydrothermal. They're mainly copper and nickel resources. They've also got a bunch of other things. They've also got manganese in them, but the manganese on land is better. They also have cobalt in them, which is, is quite interesting. Then you have number three, uh, copper-rich ferromanganese crusts. So ma manganese nodules are little round things about the size of a golf ball. The crusts are a flat version, essentially. Uh, you find these on uh, sea mounts from 1,500 meters to 3,000 meters. They're particularly valuable for cobalt, nickel, and platinum. <clears throat> and again, these are very valuable resources. They're in extremely high concentrations. Um, We'll talk about the first three, and then number four, the guys who are doing it right. Okay, so the polymetallic sulfides, that's what they look like on the sea floor. They, they are these hydrothermal vent deposits. The vents are active, but the ones they're talking about mining are usually stopped. Uh, they, you find them all over the sea floor on, on, on what they call active spreading ridges, the areas of plates. These are hydrothermal volcanic areas. The, the, the earth is formed of a series of geological plates which expand and, and collide with each other. And at the places that they're formed and collide, you have some of these, these vent deposits. Okay, the ferromanganese crusts, they look like this. They're about yay thick and they're black crustal deposits. Now, that when you find them on the seafloor, you're going to have to cut them off the seafloor. Okay, they are attached to the seafloor, but they're right at the surface. Okay, it's right, right there. It's not. Okay, and that's what they look like. They're basically like pavement in a parking lot, and mining them is like one of those big machines which comes and rips up the pavement of a parking lot, and then you have to repay. So that's kind of what you're looking at. Think of parking lot pavement, and they're about... Yay thing. About the same thickness as pavement, about the same hardness as asphalt pavement. Manganese nodules are little golf ball sized things. They sit in the mud on the deep sea floor. They form very slowly, and that's what a, that's what a very good field of them looks like. They're almost touching each other in a high concentration area. The problem with them is they're 20,000 feet down, basically. Uh, in an individual manganese nodule is worth about 25 cents in the basis of, of the metals. In order to have an operation which pays for the billion dollars that it's going to set up, you have to mine quite a few of them. The, the best place for mining these things is what we call the clarion clipperton fracture zone. The, the, the bottom of the ocean is covered with these big cracks, and, and the cracks look, if you get down in a little submarine, it looks like a cliff. It's a couple of hundred feet uh, high, and there are these cracks on the seafloor, and between these two cracks is the best field of manganese nodules. So that's, there you have the Hawaiian Islands, here you have Mexico. This is basically between the Hawaiian Islands and Mexico. Okay, <clears throat> now, one of the major arguments made by the deep sea mining folks is that the grades of metals on land are decreasing. And this is the grade of gold going from about uh, four grams per ton in the, the 90s down to about two grams per ton now. And this is true for many operations. And the idea here is, well, if this trend continues, this isn't going to look good in another 20 or 30 years. We have 7 billion people on the planet now. They are starting to get wealthier. They are starting to get older. They are starting to demand more resources. What happens when we have 9 or 10 billion people on the planet? Where are all these resources going to come from, particularly as the grades that we're mining on average are going down? Now, this is a graph for gold. The same thing is true for many other resources. So the argument is that there is great advir environmental advantage to mining on the seafloor. There's no overburden to take on. 
You don't have to blast, you don't have to dig, you don't have to make any shafts. Uh, <clears throat> you have less ore that you need to remove because the grades are so much higher, in some cases 10 times higher. You can also get many metals from the same deposit. Okay, rather than, than a, a mine that mines copper on land, at sea the mine is going to mine copper, it's going to mine nickel, it's going to mine cobalt, it's going to mine rare earths, all with the same ore, no overburden, no shafts, no human populations at sea. This looks like a miner's delight. I mean, all your expenses and all your problems are gone. So, I mean, whoa, what more could we ask? Okay, <clears throat> so th this is what applies to the first three kinds of minerals that I talked about, the polymetallic sulfides, the manganese nodules, the manganese crusts. The fourth kind of metal is offshore diamonds, the people who did it right. <clears throat> offshore diamonds are largely mined off the coast, the southwest coast of Africa. Um, <clears throat> pictured here, it is uh, one of the mining ships owned by De Beers. Um, they have just commissioned uh, a new, uh, this particular mining ship uh, is called Peace in Africa, and it's their third most recent ship. The reason that they call it Peace in Africa is to contrast their operation with all the blood diamonds that come out of Africa and are anything but Peace in Africa. Uh, they have developed this incredible technology for mining diamonds offshore, down to about a thousand meters. And here you see the mining ship. This is a processing plant on the mining ship. This is the, the uh, oil industry type technology that drops down. There are huge miners that run along the bottom. They pick up gravel. Uh, this processing plant processes them all at sea. <clears throat> they are, the diamonds are separated from the gravels by, by shining uh, light on them. The diamonds fluoresce and are blown off a conveyor belt by air. They are sealed in a can, and every day a helicopter comes, lands here, and takes the sealed can, which has never touched human hands, to De Beers security operation. So no human hand in this operation ever touches the diamonds. <clears throat> they have developed this over many, many years, this design of a ship, and there are a little more than half a dozen of these. Uh, they have laid the keel for a new ship in February based on this design. It's a $500 million mining ship, and it is being built <clears throat> by Damon Shipyard in Romania. Now, you will ask, Damon Shipyard in Romania? And the reason is that these people are very low-key, and they do not want their technology spread around by a high-profile shipyard somewhere else. If you, the Damon Shipyard is a very, very good shipyard. If you go to their website, you'll see all the nice things that they build. Not diamond mining vessels, but other vessels are highlighted in very reputable yard, but very high security and very low key, which is part of the success of this operation, I must say. Okay, okay, so <clears throat> the history of successful mining, the guys who did it right. These are diamonds off South Africa. This began with a, a drilling guy from Texas by the name of Sam Collins. Um, he actually worked with, with in conjunction with uh, George Bush I, who had developed offshore oil off Texas starting in the 1940s, believe it or not. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, Sam Collins realized the way offshore oil was going in Texas, he realized that he could get some barges and he could start with small leases off the coast of South Africa. He was actually a treasure seeker and a, uh, a, a scuba diver and worked with airlifts and all this sort of stuff. Um, he developed a successful technology 
and he got leases from the government of South Africa, then the government of Namibia, and then later on uh, Angola. He sold out to De Beers, the, the Diamonds Are Forever people, in the 1970s. And the De Beers went on, and a few other companies, De Beers aren't the only one, uh, working in, in South Africa, in Namibia, in Angola, up the coast of Southwest Africa. De Beers developed a fleet of the mining vessels that you just saw. There are oh, six or seven of them working any day off the coast of South Africa there. And as you see, those are big vessels. These are huge operations. They operate on small concessions from the governments of South Africa and Namibia. They are extremely low key. Okay, so, so they have done everything differently than, than what I'm going to describe for the other mining guys. Uh, <clears throat> if you talk to De Beers, they are very pleasant. Uh, they are very low key. They will not answer any questions. If you are very polite, they will send a speaker to your meeting, which I, I've, I've been in a couple of meetings with their speakers. The first thing they do is no press in the room, no taping, no cameras, uh, <coughs> no uh, questions to be answered with numbers, and then the guy will put up slides and go through the whole detail of what they do. But it is hard to get them to come and do that. They do give tours of their mining ships, but one tour. Okay, so very low key. They don't advertise what they're doing. Um, the, the collective diamond industry off that coast is bringing in about $3 billion a year. Uh, if you look at, their, at the figures that they publish, they are incredibly confusing because they categorize what they take off, you know, by concession and by uncut diamonds. And, and <clears throat> you know, they don't... You, you get the idea that it's a much smaller operation than it is because of the way they, they show their numbers. But anyway, it's, it's about a $3 billion operation collectively from a number of companies. Uh, <clears throat> they mine on very small concessions from the governments of, of the three countries up there. Uh, the diamonds are particularly good because the diamonds coming down the Orange River are very large. And when they, when they cut them, they, they give you particularly valuable diamond. They're much larger than, than the diamonds mined on land for a whole series of geological reasons. Anyway, uh, to give you an example of the way these operate, um, this, this is true. Uh, there was an environmentalist on a flight, uh, South African Airways, from London to Cape Town. The plane goes over the diamond mining vessels, and this guy looks out the window and sees that there's a huge plume coming off the back of these diamond mining vessels several miles in length. Guy is horrified, phones up the environmental minister in South Africa and says, you've allowed this terrible pollution, and, and <clears throat> you know what are you going to do about it? And this is an, an awful situation. So anyway, uh, De Beers finds out about it. They immediately make a call to South African Airways, to the president, and said, you will please handle this. The president says, absolutely, it will be handled immediately. So the South African Airways route is moved so that they never, <laughs> never fly over the diamond mining vessels again. All the pilots are instructed that they are to fly over the inland fishing fleet and give a speech about how clean the inland fishing fleet <laughs> is, how wonderfully they're handling the environment, and, and uh, you know what a wonderful thing they've done providing employment for the local people and everything else. That takes place ever since. No South African Airways flight ever flies over the diamond mining vessels again. Problem gone away. <clears throat> uh, the, the beers and, and the, the mining people have terrific lawyers. They have no public relations people, and they have pretty good engineers. And they're pulling in $3 billion a year. They're, this is the successful model of marine mining, operate in very close association with the governments, operate on small concessions from these governments, have a very good 
program doing all kinds of stuff. Okay, by contrast, we will now look at the other three deposits and all of the people who did it wrong. Okay, we're going to start off in the 1950s. Now remember I showed you Jules Verne and, and, and all of the marvelous resources that are come from, coming from the deep sea. Well, he finally got the, the University of California going and they, they began their economic analysis of some of these things in the 1950s by a fellow be, by the name of John Miro. John Miro uh, finished his PhD looking at the economics of manganese nodule mining in 1959. He was so impressed with this that he wrote a, a popular book published in 1965 called Mineral Resources of the Sea. Then he decided that, that this was just so incredibly good and was going to solve all of the world's problems that he went around. He was a very convincing fellow. He recently passed away. He, he went around to all of the big companies he could find, uh, Kennecott, Inco, Getty Oil, U.S. Steel, among others, and basically told them, you, you know, this deep sea mining stuff is going to wipe your minds on land out of business, we are taking over, we are going to do everything, you better get into this immediately or you're going to, uh, going to be in bad shape. He also went to, the, to uh, the United Nations and scared the hell out of every third world co uh, country because they were all of their mineral resources on land are going to get wiped out. And he also at the same time scared every environmental group because he kept using the expression, we're going to industrialize the oceans. So here you have the, they're going to industrialize the oceans. The, the, these things are, are cheaper than sliced bread. We're going to bring up all these minerals. We're going to wipe out the economy of every third world country. And these people all believed him. So anyway, uh, uh, many of these mining companies started major deep sea mining program starting in the early 1970s. They built mining ships. They went out there and tested. And then you got one other group who got very interested in that, which was the CIA. Because it, it just so happened that a Russian submarine had sunk off Hawaii. It had an explosion on board and sunk. And the Russians couldn't find it. But the, the US listing equipment out of Pearl Harbor had it located on the bottom very accurate. So they went to Howard Hughes and said, you know, Howard, how about we give you $500 million and we're going to be your partner and we're going to go into deep sea mining. And Howard said, wonderful. He had a company called Global Marine and they said we were going to have another partner, Lockheed Missiles in Space. So Global Marine, Lockheed Missiles in Space and the CIA with $500 million of CIA money, the largest amount of money that evidently the CIA has ever spent, either before or since, on any individual program. And they all of, all of a sudden start hyping deep sea mining because Howard Hughes is involved. Needless to say, the CIA's real purpose was not revealed. Uh, <clears throat> they build this mining ship, which actually is big enough so that it can lift up a Russian submarine and close some doors on the inside and keep the Russian submarine on, uh, inside undetected while they are supposedly mining for manganese nodules. They obviously built a manganese nodule miner. But all of a sudden you have deep sea mining with this $500 million input. This is looking like really good stuff. All of these major companies are going out and mining. So anyway, Part of the problem was this CIA program was so big that it was really hard to keep it secret. So they, they, they ended up pulling up the Russian submarine. The Russian submarine broke in half. They only got the first half of it. But anyway, the, the thing got uh, revealed to, to uh, New York Times in 1974. And the New York Times wrote an expose of it, which was denied for many, many years. Subsequently, there's a movie out about this called uh, Project Azorian. 
Uh, and uh, it, even the movie is a little hard to get. You can find it on the internet. Very well done. But anyway, so this thing, you know, they got as much. There, there are actually still three different stories as to exactly what they got from the Russian submarine, but they got something. Um, <clears throat> but the people didn't realize whether or not this marine mining was really any good, whether the submarine stuff has anything to do with marine mining. There was tremendous confusion, but in the meantime, this $500 million has gone into marine mining, and there are all these mining ships that are actually mining. So anyway, this has a tremendous effect. So this is terrifying third world copper and nickel producers, largely. Um, they go to, to the law of the sea people. Now, the law of the, 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 law of the sea goes back to, to 1605, to Hugo Grotius, which says, Dutchman, who said, you know, we have freedom of the high seas. And, and that's the law. By the 1950s, people were realizing that this is not an excellent law. There are some major problems here, and we need a law of the sea. Part 11 of the Law of the Sea Treaty uh, of, of 1982 dealt with marine mining. Now, the Law of the Sea Treaty didn't actually take effect until enough countries signed, which happened in 1994. The US did not sign, largely because of Part 11, which I will talk about, which is basically that the the UN, through its international seabed authority, takes hold and runs the deep sea. The deep sea is, is the stuff outside of 200 miles. Um, part 11 is very restrictive for, for reasons that I'll discuss for a company. Part 11, uh, the, deep, the International Law of the Sea Treaty also says that national countries control out to 200 miles. So basically any company now interested in deep sea mining is going to deal with a country, deal with the, the, the area out to 200 miles in, in the exclusive economic zone. Uh, Nautilus Minerals, which was a Canadian company, uh, went into this, got some leases off Papua New Guinea, and built mining equipment and actually did some test mining and finally went into, uh, basically shut down in 2018 and was dissolved uh, uh, in August of this year. So that's our, our history of this. Um, the, 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 the moral of this story is, is conveyed in the picture here and in in basically an entwined legal and policy morass does not foster a new industry. And that is what we have in, in the case of mining other than diamonds. We also have a, a problem with the leadership of the proto-marine uh, mining industry. Uh, very poor leadership, and here we have uh, marine minerals leadership uh, thinking inside the box. <laughs> so. Uh, Okay, here we have a list of the 10 largest mining companies. And I, I might add that, that this, this is from 2018 numbers. So Glencore, BHP, Rio Tinto, uh, Chinese, couple of Chinese companies, Valley, Anglo-American, Freeport, McMoran. Um, we might add to that company uh, uh, Glenmont and Barrick, depending, they've, they've recently done acquisitions and, and might come onto the bottom of this. But anyway, so, so of these companies, uh, so, so the only one of these companies that had anything to do with marine mining was Anglo American, who had a 4% share of Nautilus Minerals. But in 2018, Anglo-American uh, got disgusted and, and sold their portion at a great loss. And so they weren't having anything to do with marine mining. And that was the end of major company involvement recently 
in marine mining. Now, previously, in the times of the submarines and the CIA, uh, there had been a lot of, of company involvement. Okay, now, part of the problem is the International Seabed Authority, or ISA. Now, they released regulations on March the 22nd of this year. And I, I will note a, a couple of the regulations. So there are these regulations ensure that participation in revenues by the authority, the, the authority is the International Seabed Authority, and trans, transfer of technology to the enterprise. The International Seabed Authority is the regulator here, but it also has a mining arm called the enterprise. So the regulator is also going to be a miner. So that means the guy who, who controls you and regulates you is also mining. Okay, so, so participation in revenues by the authority and transfer of technology to the enterprise and developing states. So we're going to transfer revenues from the regulator to the part of the regulation uh, authority that's going to mine as your competitor and to developing states as provided for in the convention and the, agree and, and, and the agreement. Okay, the agreement is, is, a, is a, an add-on clause to the law of the sea treaty. So, so these, these, these regulations issued March the 20th uh, 2019 shall ensure what I just said. They also uh, shall ensure the protection of developing countries from serious adverse effects on their economy or their export earnings resulting from a reduction in the price of the affected mineral or in the volume uh, of exports of that mineral to the extent that such reduction is caused by mining in the area. The area means the clarion clippers and fractures. Okay, so here you've got the guy who's regulating you is also going to mine as your competitor and is going to transfer funds from you to the person mining to your, as your competitor plus to developing states who might lose money if you're successful. Yikes! Uh, I mean... You know, most companies turned around and said this after having been negotiated for years and years and years and re-released in March of this year reads a bit like a communist manifesto. Uh, anyway, so uh, as you might guess, of, of the 10 major mining companies that, that I have shown previously, none of them have any marine mining program really of any kind, okay? Instead, now we, we have the situation of Anglo-American who, who basically got rid of its little share of, of uh, Nautilus minerals. And, you know, I privately talked to one of the Anglo-American guys and he said, you know, that, that privately just between him and me, he wished they would have invested in whiskey and firecrackers instead. <laughs> so, I mean, that's... That's kind of the company view of it, privately by one person. That's not the, I don't think the company published that anywhere. Uh, previous to that, Tech Minerals had had a small share of, of Nautilus uh, as well. But again, they di diversified sometime before. So what, if mining companies are not interested in, in all of these deep sea minerals, what are they focused on? Okay, automation of vehicles. So we, we see this with, with trucks being automated, with drilling being automated. They're interested in the internet of things. They're interested in connecting all their stuff. They're interested in reducing staff in mine, mines, in data integration, in artificial intelligence. They're interested in electrification of mines, reduction of, of ventilation, moving from diesel equipment to electrical equipment. They're interested in recycling, in remining of tailings, dumps, and landfills, incidentally, putting mines deeper. They're interested in new areas in Africa, South America, and Russia, 
interested in real-time opt optimization and new processing technologies. If you talk to any of these major mining companies, you'll get something on that list is, is where they're focused on. Deep sea, no way. Okay, <clears throat> so just what is the legal regime for this? Well, we have the 1994 Law of the Sea uh, Convention whose principle is that all this stuff is the common heritage of mankind. They have set up the International Seabed Authority in Kingston, Jamaica. It gives you a territorial sea of 0 to 12 nautical miles, and then an exclusive economic zone out to 200 miles. This is under national jurisdiction. Um, in the U.S., this is run by the Department of the Interior and leased under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Uh, in the U.S., and many countries follow this, leases are of two types, competitive, which is typically oil and gas, and non-competitive, which is typically sand and gravel. Competitive lease means that you have a lease sale, and the, the lease goes to the highest bidder, um, <clears throat> Or you have a non-competitive lease, which is simply a negotiated lease. And you have requirements, a rent on the lease area, a royalty, a bond. And you have to, if it's a competitive lease, you have to have a lease sale agreement. And there's some other requirements. You, you have environmental requirements covered by the Council on Environmental Quality under the, the National Environmental Policy Act. And I'm sure you're all quite familiar with that. If you have a non-competitive lease, it looks like this. And basically, the Secretary of the Interior can just sign that and fills in the blanks, and it's a very easy, straightforward thing to do. Okay. <clears throat> so for our sulfides, nodules, and crusts, um, basically, we have to locate the resource look for some of the, of, the, of the technology to do that, and develop some mining technology. And the, the, mine, the engineers on this sort of stuff have been very good. The, 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 the problem with marine mining is essentially lawyers, okay, essentially the laws. Okay, for ore extraction, we have bottom crawling vehicles, various types of cutters. We can fragment and lift this stuff, and then we have a various range of, of processing technologies. This is what some of the wealth of these things looks like. There's a very rich band from some of these sulfides. And it's very important when you understand an ore to realize this means an economic deposit. So the word economic is very impressive there. This is the system of nautilus minerals, which I'll talk about. Uh, nautilus minerals basically had a, a production ship going down to some mining tools on the bottom. Their mining tools were sort of a three-part mining system on the bottom. Uh, this sort of a thing here, which is a bulk cutter, and it runs along the bottom and cuts things up. This is a, basically a rotating drum cutting it. This is another version of that. You can see the size of these things. Then they had this thing for the, the arm lifts up here and it'll cut a wall. Brings it up to, to uh, a mining ship and then a barge, which transfers it to a processing operation. Okay, this is the mining ship that Nautilus had built. Uh, this is the mining vessel in, in 28, March 2018. Okay, and th this is all of Nautilus's deep sea mining equipment in a parking lot in September of 2019. So here you have the, the various three-part pieces of cutting equipment on the bottom. So these are tested, these work. Uh, okay, so Nautilus Minerals, which was our, our, our 
poster child for mining sulfides in deep sea, bankrupt in 2019. It went to the Superior Court of British Columbia, who in August 2019 liquidated the company and had some, some considerably disparaging remarks for them. <clears throat> okay? Their share price went from $5 a share to $0.02 cents a share. Uh, one of their investors was the government of Papua New Guinea. Unfortunately, through some arrangements that the government of Papua New Guinea made, they actually took the health care budget of, of the uh, uh, people of Papua New Guinea and took the, the $157 million out of that, which went into Nautilus Minerals and disappeared. Uh, <clears throat> the government of Fiji, uh, on, on September the 19th of this year, uh, was utterly enraged at, at the way this was handled. Uh, the, the government of Fiji felt that, that the government of Papua New Guinea, a fellow Pacific Island state, had been totally duped by Nautilus Minerals, that, that they had vastly overstated the, the, the economic potential uh, involved in this. The government of, of Fiji called for a 10-year, this is on, on September 5th of this year, called for a 10-year moratorium on seafloor mining in the Pacific to last from 2020 to 2030 on the basis that, that uh, you know, the people mining on the deep sea floor could not be trusted, basically what it amounted to. This was widely accepted in the South Pacific. They got very wide support of this, including from the European Union, who said, you know what, this, this just isn't ready to go. Okay. <clears throat> With respect to the clarion Clipperton zone, uh, we have a whole series of, of companies with potential leases under the Law of the Sea uh, Treaty. We have areas set aside for environmental concerns. But the only leases that, that actually present, mining leases that presently exist are to Nautilus Minerals defunct in the EEZ of Papua New Guinea. The only uh, environmental studies that have been done have been done in terms of EISs have been done some years ago. Every one of these things has considerable technical challenges. These are solvable. Um, this is what it, what it originally looked like from a mining ship running down to a mining machine on the bottom. That's, that's a, a manganese nodule miner. This is a crust miner. This is a Korean version of this, which has been built, but is again sitting in a parking lot. Another version of what this might be look like. This is a, a German version of the same thing. This is the Nautilus system. Okay. We, we now have some NGOs and environmental groups really quite concerned about this. And one of them is the Pew Charitable Trusts, who say this on their website. The International Seabed Authority was established to manage mining on the international seabed and to protect the mining environment from its harmful effects. All mining operations, land or sea, cause environmental damage. Research strongly suggests that deep sea mining will result in loss of biodiversity, losses that may be permanent. Then, <clears throat> the Pew Charitable Trusts goes on to cite various environmental disasters caused at sea or by uh, the oil industry. This is the Deepwater Horizon from 2010 which blew out in the Gulf of Mexico, killed 11 people, and put oil all over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we now have a, a, a situation where various 
sort of recent environmental disasters are, are, are being held up as examples of industry having lost its social mandate. So the, the Deepwater Horizon 2010, 11 dead, uh, oil covers the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the 2019 uh, Brumadino tailings dam collapsed, 248 dead. This is in Brazil, owned by Vale, one of the 10 major mining companies. Uh, the San Marco tailings dam collapsed in November 2015, 19 dead. The village of Bento Rodriguez wiped off the map, tailings destroying the river course all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, again owned by, by Vale and BHP. So, so someone came recently and said, well, well, you know, there are 16 other tailings dams similar to these. Uh, what sort of, of progress has been made on those? Well, I, I, I was down in Brazil a week ago and I asked all of the 16 other tailings dams, uh, how many have been surveyed and repaired? And the answer is none, zero. Uh, well, and I go, well, how about the fines? Well, from the, the 2015 disaster, 3% of the fines have presently been paid. Vast areas of the deep Pacific are targeted for seafloor mining, yet these are some of the most poorly explored habitats on the planet. The life of the abyssal seafloor, depths of 5,000 meters or about 3 miles, is weird and wonderful. They're animals with novel adaptations, sailing sea cucumbers, predaceous sponges, yet most of these species have never been collected and are new to science. One of our main project goals is to explore the biodiversity of this region to understand how these, they will be impacted by mining activities. And in particular to assess how areas set aside from mining, protected from mining, are adequate to preserve the biodiversity of this vast region. Why do people care about mining in the deep sea floor? Well, it's covered in some areas with black potato-sized structures that are full of valuable minerals, nickel, copper, cobalt, rare earth elements that we need to make cell phones. And the supplies of the minerals in these nodules are enormous, a world supply for many decades of many of these essential metals. element of this project is to evaluate the extent to which communities on seamounts or at shallower depths uh, in, within each um, no mining zone can serve as uh, sources of larvae to recolonize communities on the abyssal plain and so that's one of the important um, routes for reestablishment of these communities after, after mining and so one aspect we've been doing is, is sampling larvae and also looking at connectivity and species overlap um, between communities in these distinct habitats. At depths of 4,000 to 5,000 meters, or about two to three miles, the deep ocean is extremely difficult to sample. It's a very remote habitat. We're using a variety of state-of-the-art techniques, such as benthic landers and remotely operated vehicles. A real technological workhorse of our project is the remotely operated vehicle Luukai. This goes, descends to the bottom of the ocean with video cameras and manipulators and collects the animals that we need to study, as well as the sediment samples that contain the diverse microbes. Among the most numerous and diverse inhabitants of the deep sea are microorganisms, yet they're chronically difficult to study. The approach that we are taking for this project is to study their genetic blueprint in order to better understand some of the ways that they obtain energy and recycled material in the deep sea.
The remotely operated vehicle is a marvelous tool because it allows you to target individual organisms, slurp them up into a chamber un undamaged, or pick up sea cucumbers very gently with its manipulator and drop it into a box. We are able to collect all kinds of animals that have never been collected before in this part of the ocean. Although we're sampling microbes and taking lots of animal samples to look at what is there, what species are there, we're also trying to ask questions about what are the animals and the microbes actually doing in the sediments. And for this we're using seafloor landers, uh, benthic chamber landers, and also what are called micro-profiling landers. And these allow us to measure respiration rates, see how much the animals and the microbes are breathing at the seafloor and also allow us to track uh, how much food they process at the seafloor that we can then compare to other areas and build up an idea of how the um, ecosystem is functioning. Baited cameras are a very useful tool to sample the mobile top predators in, in these ecosystems. So here we have one of the most common animals in the deep sea, a rat tail fish that have long tapering tails that some early scientists thought looked like a rat's tail. At the sea mounts we found swarms of eels, uh, a species that we're not sure of just yet. These are animals that are akin to lions and cheetahs on the plains of Africa. But because these, these animals such as rat tails and eels, because they're so mobile, oftentimes they avoid the ROV. So the, the baited camera system gives us a tool to attract them right in front of, of our instruments to census them. So often with the uh, natural resource management, we end up chasing our tail. The activity starts and then we come up with a plan for how to manage it and how to conserve the resource. This has happened with fisheries, it's happened with mining on land, and it's very unusual here because these reserves have been set up before the deep sea mining has begun. So we hope through our research to evaluate whether these reserves are adequate preservation areas for the region. Uh, that uh, video w was partially funded by the, by the uh, Pew Charitable Trust, again with concerns on the environmental side of, of marine mining. Okay, so for uh, other than the diamond guys, what is the current situation for marine minerals operations? Well, the ship's going down. And what is the near-term outlook? Dim. Near-term outlook is dim. Okay, there, we, you know, we, uh, most of the employees of, of Nautilus Minerals did not get looked after. All their stock options got canceled. All their pension plans got canceled. The government of Papua New Guinea lost its health care budget, and on and on and on. Okay. What is the longer-term Outlook. Well, that's a rather a different story, because here we have, we're going to take a, a, a sort of a God's eye view here. So the potential deep sea mineral resources, copper, cobalt, 
gold, lithium, manganese, molybdenum, nickel, niobium, silver, tellurium, thorium, tantalum, zinc. Good potential. Some of these rare earths that, that are there in very high degree are critical for new emerging technologies. Solar cells, batteries, super magnets, superconductors, computer chips, super alloys, fuel cells. So many, many of the, of the high-tech things that are coming on rely on these high-tech minerals, which are in short or difficult supply on land. Many critical minerals have very limited resources. China is the producer of 30 strategic and critical minerals, or uh, levels are declining on land, and you can, you can see the list there. Uh, for the United States, the fact that, that China is producing large numbers of some of these very critical things is uh, uh, an area for concern, at the least, I would say. And it's particularly an area for concern over the coming 20, 30 years. It's not perhaps an area of concern for right now. Now, I wouldn't say that everybody has given up. We have a, a Belgian mining company called Deme. Uh, it has built a couple of miners, has one that's going to be tested in 2020, another for 2023. It's spending $100 million on tests and hopes to have sort of a, a, a prototype mining operation ready for nodules by 2027. That's what their latest miner looks like. This is the the Demi guy her, uh, showing the, the head of the International Seabed Authority what their most recent miner looks like. Demi's a relatively small company. Okay, so what is the long-term outlook? So I've told you the short-term outlook for deep sea minerals other than diamonds, which have done everything right. So, so diamonds have done right. The guys who have done everything wrong what is the long-term outlook for them? And the long-term outlook is there's a vast opportunity on the seafloor which will be developed. Okay, the Pacific Ocean alone is greater than the entire Earth's land area. So the land area of the Earth is 29%. The land area of the sea is 71%. Mineral grades are much higher at sea than on land. So I think going back to my first slide that Jules Verne was right. There will be significant mines in the deep sea, but we've got a number of things to straighten out first. So there are a number of very significant legal and environmental problems which are, are by no means nicely done other than for diamonds. So on that note, I thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure to speak with you. Question. Yeah, so I thought, is it, I wasn't clear, are you saying that the mining, the lack of serious deep sea bed mining is the cause of the ISA, or is that just proximate? Uh, the, the cause of the ISA is because originally John Merrow scared all the third world mining countries. And, and they put in this part 11 of the international, uh, uh, part 11 of the Law of the Sea Treaty, which no, was... No, I get like, why we have the ISA, but I'm wondering if you think the ISA has contributed to the decline of the industry. No, I, I think the, the ISA is, is carrying out, is accurately carrying out what it states in the Law of the Sea Treaty. So, I mean, for... Most Western mining com uh, uh, companies, the law of the sea treaty is very problematic. Um, and I think that's for a Western mining company, that's the basis of the problem. So this goes back to the, the 1960s. By, by the way, John Merrill uh, ultimately threw up his hands on all of this stuff, said th th this law and all these people are utterly hopeless and became an, ex uh, an, an incredibly successful grower of roses in California and had one of the largest rose growing farms in California until he passed away very wealthy from growing roses. <laughs> is, it, is it Nautilus? Yeah.
No, no, it was not law that brought Nautilus down. It was uh, poor funding, and it, it, Nod Nautilus was vastly underfunded. And the reason that Nautilus was vastly underfunded is because the people who would normally fund this sort of stuff, yeah. you know, went marine mining hands off, so that they were getting funding from all kinds of weird little sources. I think. I mean, at the best of times, Nautilus had a reserve of a couple of hundred million dollars for an operation where they needed, needed a few billion dollars. So, so their problem was poor management and underfunding. Yeah? Uh, it strikes me from the one example of success that that occurred in a situation where it seems that they were able to completely capture the local governments to the exclusion and detriment of any other stakeholder? Uh, well, well to, the, to the local governments of three countries, right, right. Uh, South Africa, uh, Namibia, and Angola. Right. Your story uh, of the plume. Shows. Yeah, well, I, I think that the, the, the story of the plume is more a story of the way that De Beers operates than the fact that the diamond, De Beers does this, with that's not, a, a single example. If you've ever dealt with De Beers, they are very pleasant, but you don't want to meet them in a back alley. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, I, so I wonder, too, if that's, uh, you know, thinking about other contexts in other countries, if you're operating within one uh, uh, country's EEZ. If you're, if you're operating within one country's EEZ, you need to work closely with the government. You need to set up programs to have societal buy-in. I mean, you've got a, a strong societal mandate for mining both onshore and offshore in South Africa and, and in Namibia and in Angola, a little less so. But you, you've, you've got strong societal buy-in, in part because they provide jobs, they provide training, they provide social programs. They've done all the right stuff. And from my, so my most recent of experience is fisheries management in the United States. Mm -hmm. So recognizing that in the U.S. you have strong fishing stakeholders mm -hmm. who uh, you know, exist and are therefore so. influential in some way. Uh, which, so then my question is really uh, to the you know, extent that ocean mapping and ocean zoning is going to be you know, mm -hmm. crucial. Going to be, to be crucial. To parcel, parcel that yeah. out. Uh, you, you've got to have strong societal buy-in. Now, do I think all the NGOs in South Africa think highly of De Beers? I doubt it. <laughs> but they, they still, in spite of that, they have done much that is right, and they do have a strong societal mandate, which Nautilus certainly doesn't have in, in the Pacific and in Papua New Guinea in particular. Yeah. Uh, since the U.S. is not a signatory to the Law of the Seas Convention, does that mean that the ISA has no, I guess, authority over the U.S. if we decided to? You know, this, this is something that Dr. Schmidt brought up. Uh, this, there's, there's something that was signed in, in the mid-1980s called the Reciprocating States Agreement. And the Reciprocating States Agreement says that, that a, a, a country, and there are half a dozen signatories to this, reciprocating states agreement, may issue leases under its own national jurisdiction, which will be respected by all of the other signatories of this reciprocal states agreement. Now, the U.S. has signed that. I don't believe it has been revoked. The International Seabed Authority says it will honor the leases signed under the reciprocating states agreement. Now, it just so happens that there are no U.S. companies at the moment who want to carry forward with leases that were originally put forward under that agreement. However, Lockheed Missiles and Space, with their, their holdover from the $500 million from the CIA, does have one of those leases, has reassigned that lease to Lockheed UK, the United Kingdom is a signatory to the Law of the Sea Agreement. That original lease under the Reciprocating States Agreement now assigned to Lockheed UK, uh, a, international, uh, a, a signatory under the Law of the Sea, is being recognized by the International Seabed Authority. So what, 
what the what U.S. governmental body regulated? Um, it, it, it was up to this point. It, it has been well. There, there's a, a, a turf war between NOAA and the U.S. Department of the Interior. So originally NOAA controlled the, uh, the arrangement, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, controlled the administration of the Reciprocal States Agreement. Now NOAA closed down its ocean, its ocean mining office, which was also its ocean energy office, and nominally uh, sent things over to the U.S. Uh, Department of the Interior to be managed by the Minerals Management Service. Now the Minerals Management Service got closed down, and, and was replaced by the Bureau of Ocean uh, uh, Energy Management. But the Bureau of Ocean Man and Energy Management is interested in energy and is not really set up to manage minerals. Uh, and everybody has said, well, the, the, the law says NOAA is supposed to do this anyway. And NOAA said, well, maybe. So, so you, you have a, a, a policy vacuum in Washington. I guess. There's an activity vacuum. Yeah, well, there you go. So once you get some activity, you'll have to... Uh, right, right, right. What is a plume, John? Uh, a, 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 a plume is... is just, no, no, the plume that the beers was created. That's just... It's just sediment. It's just sediment. It's just sediment. It's a waste gravel. Right? right, it's a waste gravel, exactly. Well, I mean, and, it's, and some of it's fine enough that... It, it, it a lot of it is quite long, fine. But it's as if the river was being reactivated. Exactly right. Right. So it's not, it's not a... No, 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 no. It, but it, it, it's 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 a four mile long brown river which looks bad from an airplane. Yeah, John, are there any active mining operations within the, the area? No, no. And until they they finalize the, the the regulations which I showed that were put forward on on March the twenty second of this year have not been finalized. You may still comment on those regulations and until those regulations are finalized the international seabed authority cannot issue a mining lease now they can issue exploration leases and there are a whole bunch of exploration leases but the revenue sharing and uh, oh yeah the, the, i mean they that, that discourages most of the, anybody that well, well and they reiterated on march the 22nd that this will be what happens so uh, and in fact let me just go into that it, it's actually worse than I described, okay? So you, you get your lease from the International Seabed Authority who is going to regulate you. When you get your lease, you actually have to pick out two equal parcels, okay? And then the International Seabed Authority decides which one you get. The other one, they, they transfer to the enterprise, which is their mining arm. So you have, you have to do all the exploration and pick out a, a piece of land for your competitor. Then you have to transfer your technology to your competitor, the enterprise, at a price that they think is fair. Okay, so they, 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 you've picked out. A, yeah, hmm? I want that deal. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, this is a good deal. So that you've picked out a, a, a mining site, surveyed it all out, you've developed technology, now you have to transfer that to the person who's going to regulate you, but the, the second half in the back room of them is also going to be a mining company to mine as your competitor. Now, if you and the competitor are very successful and generate money and sell lots of stuff, they then can take that money and give it to a third world country who you've deprived of resources. Okay, so, so not only do you have to pay for your competitor, but you have to pay for third world land guys who lost out. Not only that, they can actually transfer money from, from, or increase your fees and take that money and transfer it to the enterprise, lest the enterprise mine in a way which is not, not efficient and lose money. So, so that they can subsidize the, the enterprise with your money and they can actually pay consultants and subsidize other things. So it's sort of, it actually reads worse than the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, so as you might guess, the, the international mining industry does not think highly of the system. Yeah, one more. So it seems like the ISA is rightfully concerned with furthering economic instability in these developing countries. Um, but I guess how do you propose that deep sea mining 
could be conducted in a way that warrants further instability because for a lot of people it may seem that the gain of a private company might not outweigh further instability in these countries where a country may have to go intervene and in, you know instability creates things you know civil wars genocide etc so I guess how do you propose that deep sea mining could be conducted in a way that well well I, I mean the United Nations could turn around and say you know what with, with this stuff, we've made a mistake. They, al they already renegotiated part of this, which is called an agreement, and, and, and watered things down a little bit. You know, they could turn around and say, you know what, this isn't going to work. No one is going to mine here. Uh, we need these resources, and, and we could renegotiate a reasonable deal that, that, that would allow international mining companies to... Look at this. I mean, when you've got every major international mining company in the world that says, you know, we, we should have invested in whiskey and, and firecrackers instead of this, uh, I mean, you know you're doing something wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, 